John Kennedy. Um, I always ask my students, you know, uh, what national holiday do we celebrate uh, that honors a, a great American socialist? And of course, uh, then that, that opens up interesting discussions about what socialism is. Um, now, part of the problem, I believe, uh, that the left has in America today, and perhaps in Europe too, where of course a lot of people still call themselves socialists. Um, Sherry talked about some of the some of the problems uh, with how that. The meaning of that has been hollowed out uh, and needs to be filled up again in, in, in new and pertinent ways. But um, one of the problems that I think progressives and liberals have had uh, since the 1960s is that there really is no you know, powerful socialist left, no, no left uh, people who really understand really what that, what that term means, who understand that the, uh, the great positive visionary uh, meanings of it Michael talked about uh, to some extent, as well as the obvious, obvious uh, historical baggage attached to places like uh, North Korea and uh, the Soviet Union. Um, uh, you know, liberals and progressives have always needed, uh, I'm arguing, in the 20th century, a left, uh, and a, you know, explicitly or not explicitly socialist left to push them, uh, to push them towards um, greater economic equality, to talk about fraternity, you know, in, uh, in meaningful ways, um, or solidarity, which is a, a term that is somewhat more uh, acceptable in American uh, parlance than, than fraternity, which of course is associated with drunken parties. Um, uh, and since we haven't had that for the last 40 years, really, uh, in any meaningful sense, um, I think uh, it's been more difficult for figures who are obviously uh, have been friendly in the past to what you might call socialist ideas, uh, people like Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, for that matter, to, to uh, be able to move uh, farther to the left uh, the way some of us would have liked them to have done, or would still like them to do. Um, this is a matter of, of having a movement, of course, as Michael said. It's also a matter of, of um, having some uh, goal, even though we might never reach that goal, uh, which people can point to. Um, even though, you know, we are, in effect, a social democratic magazine uh, descent in most cases, uh, nevertheless, I, I like to think we also um, are, is, are a magazine which does not, you know, sneeze at the idea of utopia, you know, uh, not as something to, to, to fight and die for, but as something to uh, continue to hold out there as uh, a sense of what human beings are capable of. Um, one of my favorite um, lines from uh, the whole history of dissent, 56 years now, was actually written by uh, Irving Howe and Luke Hoser in one of the first issues of dissent, uh, which, and they basically stole it from Tolstoy. Um, and that was, uh, they said, socialism is the name of my desire. Socialism is the name of my desire. Um, I continue to quote that to people, though I, I usually add, but, you know, liberalism is the name of my politics. Uh, but um, I think keeping that balance uh, at all times, it's really important to uh, not just keeping the dream of socialism alive, which is sort of a nostalgic impulse, but more than that, to really um, continue to inspire people, to motivate people to, uh, to make a better world. Um, I'd like to open up for, for questions to everybody, but um, perhaps I'd just, if it's okay with folks, I want to ask one question to the people on the panel, because something I was thinking about as, as you all were speaking. Um, what, what, what about the problem of the state? <laughs> that is one of the issues in America, of course, as we know very well, the Tea Party movement, and I think also in, in, in Europe and, and probably other countries as well, um, is that socialism is identified with uh, a stronger state, a more protective state, a more nurturing state, whatever, nanny state, some would call it. Um, and that's a problem, I think, because that concept is not so, is not so popular. I think so, not in this country, um, and perhaps not not so popular in, in UK right now and, and other parts of, of Europe as well. You know, how do how do we as people who are friendly to this tradition deal with that? Uh, perhaps at times albatross. Is that something that people would like to comment? On? Yeah. Shall I go in quickly? Uh, 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 no, I think it is a, an absolutely critical issue, but it's a problem not just for us. It's a problem uh, actually for neoliberals, and it's a problem for uh, the right and conservatism. Uh, after all, um, those 13 bankers were called on, was it September the 18th or you know, 2008, called to Washington and <laughs> told that you know, they were going to have to accept um, the TARP and they were going to have to accept uh, 
massive government stakes being taken, shareholding stakes in their concerns. And uh, they were given an hour to think it over, and um, they could consult with a friend and all that. In the end, they did. For some reason, they accepted it. You know, uh, uh, they went along with. It. They realised, and that that's deeply embarrassing. And I think they're still reeling from you know the consequences of that. I think also uh, what I feel is that uh, you know socialists do see the state having to make large dramatic changes, including in the structure of ownership, but it should all be in the direction of divesting itself as almost as quickly as possible of uh, that power and extending it and decentralizing it. Uh, that's why I think ideas of networks of social funds or of uh, you know forms of public ownership and social ownership that are quite in, that empower people on a broad scale and don't just empower the center. Uh, and with, with the centre remaining much more as a sort of coordinating force, mm. but, um, but with my, uh, so I, I think that's absolutely critical to um, addressing this question and, and and really the lack of belief people have because centralised governments have created as many problems as they've solved. Well, I mean, clearly, suspicion of the state is a huge issue in the. U.S., I mean, the larger and more diverse society you have, the easier it is to see your government as sort of foreign and not, you know, sort of not necessarily sympathetic to you. I mean, this is not yet a huge problem in Europe where if you poll people, it's not so much that they're suspicious of government activity, they are suspicious or dislike certain kinds of government activity, but there's not the same widespread suspicion of government or the state that you see in the U.S. I mean, this is largely, I think, even in the United States, a question of... Um, uh, perception. I mean, there's a nice article in this, this issue of dissent, for those of you who have read it, maybe you all have, by a fellow whose name I can't remember, talking about how much of the sort of shift to neoliberalism was initiated by government policies, whether it is to deregulate or to actually put in place Dean policies. Baker's, yeah. Yeah, the Dean Baker's piece of market fundamentalism. Right, which yeah. just makes the very Polyanias point that shifts towards more market based orders require government action to facilitate them. So it's not so much that government action is absent in the U.S., even in periods that we perceive to be as, you know, sort of broadly liberal or neo-market in tendency. It's a question of what people will accept. The current health care reform, which is being sold as socialism, right, is largely bereft of, you know, the sort of state action that we would expect in a European context, right? But it has been very effectively sold as this kind of massive expansion of government power when, in fact, to the most part, doesn't really touch, you know, the power of, you know, big pharmaceutical corporations or insurance companies or anything like that. It's it's largely a question of not just what Americans think about the state in the abstract, but how certain kinds of policies are sold. And the very the very process of the healthcare debate strikes me as a perfect example of how the left often, you know, drops the ball, which is that this has been sold as some kind of giant government intervention, strikes me as a consequence as much of the Obama administration's inability to market itself and market this reform correctly as it is of Americans' deep-seated, you know, antithetical views of the state. I mean, the same people, as we know, who said, don't touch my Medicare, were saying, we don't like health care reform. You know, so it, it's, there's clearly some, there's clearly a deep suspicion of the state in the U.S., which, again, I think largely springs from a lo the larger and more diverse society we have, but there's also clearly a sense in which the left, or in this case, the Obama administration, perhaps has dropped the ball in making clear what they were doing was not some kind of you know North Korean or you know sort of Soviet policy at all, but it was, but rather simply an attempt to kind of in many ways bring market forces into an industry that is largely bereft of. Them. Um, well, so, so much of the um, of the uh, campaign against uh, the central the expansion of the central state is being conducted by people whose goal is to capture the right. central state and who essentially are, have captured it. Um, so we should indeed be um, the advocates of state power when state power is necessary and decentralization and what Robin called empowerment um, whenever that is possible. And then the question is when is it possible because you need, you need demand for empowerment. Uh, there has there have to be people prepared to be empowered, 
and prepared to, to use the power that we propose to decentralize and